China's system is now a very viable, in the eyes of many, uh, alternative to the U.S. system. You see a competitive system now, achieving something no other country in history has ever done, two decades straight of double-digit GDP growth year after year. Hi everyone, I'm Ian Bremmer, and welcome to your G-Zero world. This week we have General David Petraeus talking to us about the war on terror, counterinsurgency, military to military, the extended Middle East, and a lot of other things in between. Also, on puppet regime, President Donald Trump goes to Russia. I think you're going to want to watch that. But first, your world this week. First to Germany, where Chancellor Angela Merkel's efforts to put together a coalition fell apart. She'll still be chancellor, either a new grand coalition with the Social Democrats or with early elections. But either way, it's going to take longer time. It's going to be a weaker government. And the main reason, Alternatives for Deutschland, the far-right Nationalist Party, in big opposition in Parliament. And that means everyone, including Merkel, has to protect their flank against Euroscepticism, against anti-migrant policy. It's weaker for governing Germany. It's much weaker for strengthening Europe, and it's a weaker voice globally. Still, Merkel is not going anywhere. She will still be chancellor. And then to Egypt, 305 dead in a terrorist attack, a town of 800 in Sinai. It's the worst attack in modern Egypt history. Um, clearly, Sinai, uh, part of Egypt bordering Israel, uh, has more per capita violence from terrorism than literally any place in the world, more than Afghanistan, more than Syria, more than Iraq. This is a challenge to the leadership of President Sisi, who will use the opportunity to crack down hard against anything that looks like an extremist Muslim from his perspective. Uh, doesn't make a difference in terms of his elections next year, 2018. He wins easily. But are you thinking about the Egyptian economy and its opportunity to open Open up going to be harder as a consequence of what's going to be martial law in this region. The North Koreans tested another missile after a two-month hiatus. We forgot that the North Koreans were even around. They keep testing longer and longer missiles. Actually, the missiles are the same size, but they hit harder trajectories. They can actually hit Washington, D.C. If they were really focused on it, they're not. Look, what the North Koreans are working on right now is showing publicly greater deterrent capability. And once they do that, they've already made pretty clear to the Chinese in talks and to the South Koreans that they would like to engage in diplomacy. The question is going to be, is Trump up for it? The big thing is Olympics in South Korea coming soon. And the South Koreans would love a North Korean delegation. I think there's an opening for talks right now, but it's possible the Americans are going to be on the wrong side of the Chinese, the South Koreans, and the North Koreans. That is what you should be really watching for over the next couple of months. And finally, I don't talk much about Trump's tweets, but in this case I'm making an exception. Uh, three retweets of videos promoted by an ultra-right nationalist British organization depicting Islamic violence against non-Muslims. Uh, led to big backlash from the UK Prime Minister and other governments in Europe, but that's not the most important point. The most important point is it displays that w Muslims are increasingly not welcome in the United States. Um, it means that Muslims are much less likely that live in the United States to work with counter-terrorist organizations, with their local police, um, to help deal with a terrorist threat, something that the Europeans have never gotten much cooperation on, but the Americans have. That's a problem for U.S. security. It's also a problem because if you're a high-talent individual of uh, Muslim religion, uh, then you're much less likely to want to live in the United States in that kind of a political environment. So it's a security problem. It's an economic problem, too. The other side of the coin, of course, is that politically it works pretty well for Trump's base, and that's why I think you're going to see him only escalate it going forward. On a lighter note, uh, Trump did have some Twitter problems with his password recently and he had to go someplace very, very different to deal with it. Why don't you watch Puppet Regime?
I'm Ian Bremmer, and I'm delighted to be here with Mr. Donald J. Trump, 45th President of the United States. Mr. Trump, things always seem to be so great for you. So I have to ask, have you ever had a day that was not great? Well, I'll tell you, Ian, I have. And uh, it was, and so not long ago, I had a horrible day, just a tremendously horrible, terrible, bad day. And so what happened was I woke up and I realized that I was locked out of my Twitter and could not remember the password. Well, now, that is breaking news. It, I mean, it must have been terrible. You were totally defenseless. Completely, totally defenseless, okay? Failing media all over me, okay? I called the IT department at the White House, and because I canceled everyone's visas, of course, there is no IT department at the White House. And so there was only one place that the newspapers told me I could go where everyone could help. Russia. I'm here in New York City overlooking Central Park at KKR offices and delighted to be with General David Petraeus. He was director of the CIA, ran Central Command, in charge of American forces during wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and now is a partner here at KKR. Delighted to have General Petraeus here with us on G Zero World today. So, General, let me start sort of right in your ballywick, which is war on terror uh, and Iraq, Syria, ISIS. I mean, how, how do you think it's really going? Right well, now? obviously, we're on the verge of defeating the Islamic State in Iraq and in Syria. So, I think it's going quite well. It's taken a while to get going. Uh, the previous administration does deserve credit, I think, however reluctant they may have been, understandably, to put forces back on the ground in Iraq having removed them back in uh, the late part of 2011, uh, really developed an approach that I think is revolutionary and slightly overlooked. Uh, we basically have enabled others to defeat the Islamic State. What we've done is we've reconstituted Iraqi forces that performed poorly and then advised and assisted and most importantly enabled them uh, with the use of our intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance platforms, uh, precision strike assets, and industrial strength ability to fuse intelligence. ISIS gotten more capable, in your view, in terms of adapting? ISIS is very different in certain respects. One of them is their ability in cyberspace. And so I think we have to point out that even though the ground caliphate is just about taken away from them and the ISIS army has been defeated, uh, there will still be a virtual caliphate. In cyberspace, there will still be access uh, to these various videos and to exhortation uh, instructions on how to make explosives. So this is a generational struggle in which we're engaged. And why it's so important that we've been able to help others to do the fighting and defeat uh, the Islamic State in Iraq and in Syria is that we have to have a sustained commitment. Uh, this is not the fight of a decade, much less a few years. It's going to be many decades. Uh, there will be ups and downs. We've had some important battlefield successes, but this is going to continue. Where does the fight now turn? Um, uh, to what extent is there enough uh, focus being placed on other areas where counterinsurgency is going to be a big priority for the Americans? Well, first of all, I've always said I, I, that I had no doubt, in fact, even in the darkest days uh, for Iraq, that with U.S. Uh, support with U.S. advice and assistance uh, that Iraqi forces reconstituted would be able to uh, defeat the Islamic State. And that has turned out to be true. But I've also said that the battle that mattered most was not the battle against ISIS, uh, the army, if you will. It's the battle after that. It's the battle for power uh, and resources uh, in the land of the two rivers, uh, a country that has vast resources. Uh, of course, not just energy, but also the unique amount of water, uh, the only oil producing country of, of any magnitude that has that level of water in the Arab world, uh, and a variety of other mineral uh, blessings as well. Uh, and it has always been the case. This has always been about, again, who has that power uh, in terms of government uh, and the ability to divvy up the resources. So, I mean, we've done the driving, we've done the leading, we've been effective on the military front in Iraq. Would you argue that diplomatically the Iranians have actually been winning so far? The Iranians are very good at, at spying a wave and, and surfing it. Uh, and they have made the most of their opportunities 
uh, because of the Syrian civil war and because of the uh, advent of ISIS in Iraq. Um, now, Iraq knows that they always have to have a relationship with Iran, but just because they're two Shia countries, I think people shouldn't leap to the conclusion that, that Iraq wants to be, metaphorically speaking, the 51st state uh, of Iran. Uh, they do not. They're very conscious of the differences uh, in language and ethnic and everything else, uh, but they do have to have a relationship. So on the other side of that, obviously, is Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Um, a lot going on there. Before we talk about the domestic, let's talk about the geopolitical. Um, where do you give them good marks or lousy marks in their ability um, to counter what has clearly been a geopolitical wave against them over the past few years? Well, they've had limited ability to do s certain actions in certain places, certainly. Uh, although they have certainly been part of the coalition against the Islamic State and a, and a significant part of it. Uh, they have flown, they've dropped bombs, uh, and they've been engaged in that. Uh, but of course, they've had a major involvement in Yemen. Uh, and, you know, I'm one of those who I think I'm a bit more understanding of what's taken place there, perhaps, because I remember when Saudi Arabia uh, was criticized as wanting to fight to the last American. And they decided here that the Shia Houthis, supported by Iran, who couldn't get what they wanted at the political bargaining tables uh, in Sana'a, so they decided to get it with force of arms. Are the Saudis going to face in Yemen at the end of a military campaign uh, the same kind of problem that the Americans are facing in Iraq, but on a, in a sense on a much worse scale because I mean, the, the economy more, is nowhere. Right? I think it's more challenging. Yeah. Uh, you, you don't have the prospect of $100 billion of oil revenue and, and a variety of other uh, mineral and, and natural gas assets. You look at the state of the region as you've just described it. Can you bet on the Saudis in that environment? And should the Americans be betting on them as much as they seem to be in the Trump administration? The, the crown prince, uh, who now has consolidated power with the support of his father uh, and the approval of his father, uh, the king, uh, is embarked on a revolution to completely retool uh, the Saudi economy. They have to do that. You can do the math, take the amount of sovereign wealth fund less than 500 billion, recognize they probably need to keep at least 200 of that untouched to keep the banking system and the currency and so forth solvent. Uh, and they're running deficits that are somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 60 billion dollars a year, perhaps even a bit more. Um, you can do the math. They have to transform this economy. They have to diversify it. They cannot continue to rely on just oil exports uh, as the driver of that economy, with, especially with the expectation that prices are not going to rebound. No, no, clearly they need to make the changes. So that's a revolution. Yes. But to enable that revolution, I'm pretty certain the Crown Prince realizes that he's got to drive it. It can't be done the way that, that they've done business in the past, which is relatively consensual, uh, lots of, of meetings, discussions, and very, very slow pace. The conservative forces have been quieted. Uh, dozens of clerics have been removed or, or, or silenced. Uh, and now, of course, there's a, a revolution in governance. This power is now concentrated in one individual, uh, and he is going to drive this country and do the very best that he can to transform it uh, in the time that they have, which is certainly less than 10 years before the money runs out uh, and they have challenges in the world markets uh, getting so, more. Do you think the strategies being offered right now um, by the Trump administration um, are up to the challenge? So it's still early days, I think, in that regard. Uh, it has to be pragmatic, has to be sustainable again, has to be prudent, uh, should be firm but not provocative. Um, and again, I think that is still all very much uh, work in progress. And the centerpiece right now, of course, is getting China's attention to do more uh, about essentially a client state, at least in the sense that 90% of the trade goes to and from North, North Korea. Korea through China. Uh, and so getting China to do more to bring pressure on North Korea to stop the missile testing and stop the nuclear testing, I think, is the, the imperative uh, of, the, of the moment. I mean, how do, so how do you do, how do you effectively check China when their military capabilities in their backyard and their economic capabilities are growing so dramatically and their willingness to develop political leadership to back that up is also behind it? 
the, for the next few decades or longer, this is going to be uh, the challenge that we're going to have to deal with. Uh, it's a bit concerning to see, to hear some of the rhetoric from the 19th Party Congress, uh, how assertive it is, uh, certainly not hiding the light under a bushel any longer, talking about aspirations to be the global leader and with certain timelines and all the rest of that. Now, recognizing that this is our number one trading partner as well as, again, our number one strategic competitor, uh, we obviously have to get this right. But it's a very, very interesting moment. And by the way, I've encouraged some old departments in which I taught and so forth in the past to, to reestablish the uh, comparative politics courses that went by the by at the end of history, uh, again in 1990, 91. Because China's system is now a very viable, in the eyes of many, uh, alternative to the U.S. system, uh, and so the sense that at the end of uh, at the end of history, at, with the Soviet Union uh, dissolution, uh, that that system was completely uh, invalidated, you see a competitive system now, uh, single party rule, uh, very different freedoms and so forth, but very successful. Are we capable, and have we been capable under the Trump administration of responding to that challenge? Intellectually speaking, if you will, we're capable. I mean, we have the capability. Uh, the question is whether we can organize properly for this, whether we can get the big ideas fully right and fully developed, uh, and then whether we can implement them. And so this is where you have to look at the State Department uh, and note that there are numerous of the Assistant Secretary positions, uh, including uh, Near East affairs, Far East, and so forth, that have not been uh, filled, and to my knowledge, haven't even had people nominated in, in many of those cases. So Tillerson's top priority as Secretary of State and the internal reorg and cutback is would not be your priority. That can be a priority, but he's got to populate these positions. Do you want to say what's surprised you on the concern side over the last year? Where do you think the biggest holes are? and what the Americans need to be doing to check these threats around the world. I think one of the lessons that we learned in the past 16 years is that you cannot counter terrorists like ISIS and Al-Qaeda with just counter-terrorist force operations. Military action is often necessary, but it is seldom sufficient. Despite all the military successes, you don't want to see an unbalanced capacity of the United States and the other pieces need to be prioritized just as much. I was one of those who was asked by successive secretaries of state, along with Admiral Mullen, I might add, to go up to Capitol Hill and to speak to the appropriations subcommittee uh, that dealt with funding for the State Department. It's because I was a champion for their uh, budget as well as obviously for the, the uh, defense budget. And the reason is if they can't do or don't have the capability to do what we need them to do, what the country needs them to do, and the military needs them to do, then oftentimes the military has to do it. And we may or may not be uh, as good at that task uh, as they are, the professionals, needless to say. So what surprised you uh, from the Trump administration in terms of foreign policy and national security? We're almost at one year right now. I know the team around the president exceedingly well. It's a superb national security team. So maybe it's less surprising to me than it might be to others. But I think many individuals have been struck by the fact that despite the campaign rhetoric, the post-campaign commentary, I think American foreign policy would be assessed as having more continuity uh, than change. Certainly there are areas of change, uh, although we're still not certain of how big that change will be, and those would be in trade, uh, climate, and immigration policies. But on national security but, policies. But on the broad national security policies, uh, after criticism of NATO and so forth, ultimately yeah. embraced it, Iraq. Uh, criticized China, embraced the one China policy, uh, criticized Japan and Korea to a degree of not bearing their share of this, and, and actually has now developed very good relationships. You can work your way around all of these different elements of American foreign policy, and generally, uh, it's a bit more continuity than change, despite the occasional. To be fair, uh, lack of I mean, when, when Trump first came in, um, the national security team looked very different, right? I mean, you had Flynn, you know, sort of his national security advisor. You had Bannon. You had Gork. I mean, you had a lot of people that would have raised, you know, views from lots of external observers that they'd be moving in a different direction. Those guys are all gone. 
the people that you're referring to that you know very well are folks that I think most observers would feel pretty comfortable with actually running the, running the shop. So there has been a big personnel change too. Well, some of the early appointments as well. I think, yeah. uh, again, Secretary Mattis, I think Secretary Tillerson substantively is, has been very solid, frankly. Again, much more continuity uh, than change in, in his approach. Uh, and in some of the areas where there have been slight changes, I think uh, perhaps even for the better. But I think that's, that's a bit jarring to some people who, you, obviously you have to read the tweets, but you can't get uh, just riveted on those. You need to follow the troops, follow the money, and follow the substance of policies. And you'll see that in NATO Europe, there are more troops out in the Baltic states and in eastern Poland. Uh, there's more money there uh, for uh, refurbishing and rebuilding some of the defense capabilities that we drew down in the wake of the dissolution of the Soviet Union in the fall of the wall. There's even two new NATO commands going to be established, uh, one to facilitate the logistics of getting out to Eastern Europe and the other focused on maritime challenges that have reemerged with the resurgence of Russia. General David Petraeus. Great to be with you. Thank you very much. Good to see you, friend. Just beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful bride. Just beautiful, wonderful. Uh -huh. Probably an eight. Probably. Definitely not an eight. No way she's an eight. Uh, this one over here, well, no, a little, a little big for my liking, to be honest with you. I mean, really. Trying to understand how, the, how I can find my password here. They told me everyone in Russia is a hacker, okay? У меня большая проблема. Какая? Слушайте. Я забыл пароль к Твиттеру. Твиттер? Шесть, шесть, шесть. Как? Я как? Шесть, шесть, шесть. He says it might be president. Let's try. Our president. Наш президент. Our president. Ваш президент. And Putin. And, and well, he's a very good friend of mine, as you know. I don't know how, oh, to, how you two will be remember your president. You see, she speaks English. I think she's probably a hacker. In Russia, they can do everything, really. <laughs> so could you help? Could you help me with my uh, with your phone? With my password? Uh, 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 yeah, good. Yeah. No, 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 no. no. Yeah, yeah. Как вас зовут? Ты провокатор. Ты знаешь что ты? Ты провокатор. Ты что ты здесь сидишь, блядь? Ты чё здесь сидишь? Слушай, ты тоже иди отсюда вон, блядь. Да, это не кукла, это пропаганда. Какая, какая пропаганда? Wow, very, very unfair treatment. Do you see Порвём, так и скажи, порвём. Very rude, very, very rude. Hello, hello, I'm a big, I'm a big celebrity. Hello, ni hao, ni hao, ni hao, ni hao. China is a big, big problem. Let's take a selfie, okay? Like that. Is it good? Is it good now? Does it, does it look great? I think it looks beautiful. When you're a star, they just let you do it. Watch it. It's like a magnet, okay? Will you, will you kiss me? Will you kiss me? Oh, oh, my goodness. Can you believe it? I wish I could tweet about this, but I can't. But in the end, nobody in Russia could help me. It was very, very bad, and I was in a dark place about to do something truly really terrible. And just then... Who is that? Donald, hello. Uh, sorry I did not get back to you sooner. Uh, you are enjoying Russia, yes? Can you... help me? With Twitter? Ha! Huh, I can't even buy an ad on Facebook these days. You're on your own. Public machine! That's it for the show this week. Next week, come back and you will see Fei Fei Li, who is the chief scientist for artificial intelligence and machine learning at Google Cloud.